you know, I, I get asked in interviews, hey, does it, you know, are you affected by these negative things that we've read online about you? Mm-hmm. And I'll say, let's show me. And there'll be five negative things that someone's found on Twitter that day. And we'll be, as we're speaking about the five nasty tweets, uh, there'll be a queue outside of thousands of people coming into the venue. And so, you know, you look in the journalist in the eye and you can either be affected by those four negatives or you <laughs> go, is this is this out of proportion? Are you, right, the, yeah. the people who are tweeting, they're, you know, they're probably, in a, you know, men in their middle ages still living with their parents, probably at home with their trousers around their ankles, <laughs> sending you a negative, <laughs> nasty tweet. Yeah, I'm a kind of a junk food aficionado. Um, if I was to have a last meal, it would be buffalo wings um, as a starter. Then maybe yeah. an In-N-Out burger from California, you know, with a Coca-Cola and maybe a Corona chaser. <laughs> I'm a happy man. I'll die a happy man. Flats or drums? <laughs> the actual, the wings themselves. Yeah, not the drums. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're very, He's like, no. I mean, it's always sad when it comes with the drums and then you kind of, you have to, yeah, it's it's always an internal debate as to whether I can ask them (laughs) just for the wing. (laughs) Yeah, I'm the same way. I like the wings better. Yeah, the flats. The flats, flats, yeah. I'm actually writing a book on wings. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's called, wow, Wings of the World, wow. And and my band and I, you know, we we tour the world and and check out the wings everywhere. Obviously, North America is is really the only place you get decent wings. Have you had wings in Toronto? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Do you remember the name of the place? Well, I don't, but it's probably going to be something like Wing Stop, Wing mm-hmm. some, some sort of Buffalo <laughs> Wings. <Emporium. laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Japan's the only other place with good wings. Really? Yeah. Interesting. The Brits can't do wings. No? No. No. How come? Just not a thing. Uh, maybe it's our chickens. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, James Blunt, welcome to the Gents Talk welcome. Podcast. Thank it's great you. to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. We're really excited to have this conversation with you. Uh, Me, you too. I've been building up to it for a long time. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. So um, you're doing a lot of stuff. You're obviously in Toronto now. Uh, you're doing a lot of media. You've got an album coming. Yeah. Um, but for a lot of people who know James Blunt, they know you as the guy that put out that song. That guy. Right? The that guy song. who sang that song. That song. Yeah. But who's who's the man behind the persona? Who's James um, well, you know, I put out these really, uh, I do put out some pretty earnest music, don't I? It's all quite serious. That's really just because misery sells and I, yep. and I like how it sells. <laughs> uh, but uh, but I'm not really that person um, in everyday life. It's just, just the way it's turned out. I guess I always wanted to be a rock star um, and, you know, and be in a band, but you need friends to be in a band. So mm. I ended up just with an acoustic guitar <laughs> on my own, writing sad songs and, and, and you're beautiful as the result of that. But, um... But yeah, in everyday life, I guess I'm not really necessarily that person. I'm more of just a court jester. Hmm. And you were in the army first. Yes. Uh, before I was a musician, I was in the army for six hmm. years. I was a reconnaissance officer. So my job was to creep around in bushes um, and and stalk an enemy. And, you know, now I just stalk normal civilians like <laughs> like you two. Uh, and I'm designed for that, really. I'm a smaller human being and, and you know, bushes are my forte. So what... What made you transition from being in the army for six years? Because that's a considerable amount of time. So going from being in the army to deciding to make music, or was that always in the forefront? It was always my ambition. Since I was 14 years old, I started telling people I'm going to be a musician. And uh, But I, I was subsidized from school and university by the army. They paid for my education, mm-hmm. and so I owed them at least four years. I really enjoyed it. it. It was really interesting. It's an education. It's an education in the world. I come from a really safe background as you know safe country and to join the army was was to see the real world not only do you work work with people from all corners of your own country and see you know what what they with their own upbringings their own lifestyles their own characters and what they can bring to it but you go and work in different countries where security and stability aren't guaranteed and and it opens your eyes to how lucky you are um i ended up doing six years there um last two years in London as the Queen's ceremonial bodyguard, which is a mm. bizarre gig, but, but you know, kind of really for Japanese tourists uh, to take photos <laughs> of. Um, <clears throat> but I'd always told people I'm going to be a musician and I, and I was always writing songs. I always had a guitar nearby. Um, 
in the army, I'd you know even strapped to the outside of a tank, I'd had to take a guitar. And eventually people said, James, please stop talking about this. Stop telling us you're going to be a musician and, and go <laughs> and do it. And, uh, and so eventually that's what I up sticks and did. Was there any doubt in your mind that this was going to work? Uh, you know, it's a, a risky business. Um, my dad was really clear on it. He said, because he's an army man himself, he was a colonel, an, an army helicopter pilot. And he said that the music business is very tricky to be successful in. And my reasoning with him was actually that it depends how you measure success. Mm. If you really are going to measure success in just financial terms, um, then yeah, it's a really tricky business. Uh, but if success instead is about pure, the sense of happiness, um, you know, the joy that you get from a job, that that's, you know, that's perhaps a better measure of, of success. Um, the smile on your face that a job gives you. And, and if I've been telling people I've got this ambition, if I'd then reached the end of my life saying st the same thing, or once I, you know, had a dream to be a musician, if I, and, I, and I hadn't had the courage to chase that dream, then life would have been a wasted, a wasted life. Um, so yeah, so it, it was, it was definitely a gamble. But the gamble was just to enjoy it, put out some music for a period of time, and then at least I would have been able to say, I've, I've given it a shot. As it is, things kind of worked out pretty well. Quite well. 21 years now. Just, you know, a little bit of luck along the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. How much time between when you decided to get into music full time, like really pursue it, and when you put out You're Beautiful? Uh, I think I left the army in 2002. Uh, I got a manager two weeks before I left the army. He's nice. still my manager and he's next door somewhere uh, <laughs> listening in. Um, and uh, and then we signed to a publishing uh, uh, company for my songwriting um, called EMI Music Publishing. That was sort of six months afterwards. Got a record deal probably a few months after that, a year, maybe a year after that. And so by 2004, I'd released You're Beautiful in the UK. And that, that was a hit right away. Well, no, we released it as part of an album, and albums, you normally kind of count the first week sales. That's the measure of success in the music business, how many albums you sell in the first week, which made me really nervous, because I wasn't going to sell many in the first week. I didn't know anyone, you know. Uh, I just knew a couple of blokes in the army, and they, they didn't like my music. They weren't going to buy it. <laughs> so I spoke to my label, and I said, you know, rather than you guys count first week, can we do me a favor? Can we just put the album out, see if anyone buys it, and then if they maybe tell their friends, then maybe we'll have a growth for the second week if people like it they'll tell their friends and it'll grow naturally and the label said okay it's you know it was a different approach from them from normal it's, you know it's called a soft release we released a song called High it got some radio play we released a song called Wise Men and it got in the charts and it got the album into the top 20 and then we hit them with the biggie um, and chucked out You Beautiful and then um, and the, yeah and, and that stage that was 2005 in the UK didn't happen until 2006 in, uh, in North America. Hmm. But um, but then the, the world for me blew up. What did that world look like? If we were a fly on the wall when all of that started happening, what would we have seen? Um, you would have seen someone in a mild state of panic uh, because when I got the phone call, I was in a hotel in Switzerland. I was just about to support a Jamiroquai um, nice. at a festival. He uh, first of all, he was really brassed off that uh, the support act he'd been booked was this non-entity guy. Um, so he's like, you know, who the hell's booked to play with me? And then that day, I got the phone call saying it's gone to number one, knocking Coldplay off the top of the album chart, and the singles at number one as well. And then Jamaica was really brassed off <laughs> that their support act was <laughs> suddenly now the number one that week. Um, he was nice to me though, and he's been he's been very sweet to me. Um, but uh, but as I got the phone call. On my own, this hotel room, I got it from the radio rep from the record label. It's not supposed to come from the radio rep. It's supposed to be your manager who tells you. Mm -hmm. But he was excited and he called and I and I kind of put the phone down and I think I had a little panic there. Thinking, wow, number one is a, is going to change things. Um, you know, I was hoping for number two. Because then you're a musician, but you're still not a celebrity. And you mm -hmm. can still walk under the radar. The number one changes things and your face is really very visible at that stage. So I walked up and down the hotel room swearing a lot, <laughs> thinking, you know, what's this? Because as I say, I'm the little guy who likes to hide in bushes. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and suddenly, you know, your job as a reconnaissance officer is to not be seen by people. And suddenly you're going to be very visible. How did that feel to knowing that you were in the, you used to just be so quiet in this renaissance and now you're faces everyone every recognizes you yeah you know what there are some pros and there are some cons uh 
you know, what should I talk through first? Let's talk about the cons. <laughs> uh, the cons, yeah, is just, you know, you, I suppose, you know, what, what should be private is, is a struggle to keep private. In the, in the UK, we had the phone hacking scandal where the newspapers was li- were listening to our answer phone messages. And, you know, and the notion of some of them probably have gone through our emails. They definitely go through your bins. Um, and... You know, what else changes? As you walk down the street, they ask me, you know, does fame change you? It doesn't really change you. It changes everybody else, everyone else. They, they, they react to you differently. You can be a normal pers- person walking down a street and no one notices you. Suddenly when you're famous, everyone starts to act a little crazy. Um, and and for me, at least they've been sweet. You know, it's just asking for a photograph and an autograph. That's fine, as long as you're not really desperately trying to go to a loo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, or catch a flight. Um, but otherwise, it's, you know, that's that's... You know, that's uh, something you deal with. But it's everyone else who goes a little crazy. You just then adapt to that. There are some pros to it as well, though. Yes. Definitely. You know, <laughs> I was a young single man and before it had been a struggle to get into a nightclub. Suddenly, <laughs> I no longer had to queue for a nightclub. <laughs> I was being swept to the front. And that's probably all I ever wanted from fame. Yeah. Yes. yes. But now you got 10 times that. I mean, you know, it was an awesome time and I did have great, great fun. I, you know, I've, uh, I kicked off my first tour uh was two and a half years long in the end um toured around you know the, the entire world here in, in canada included in the and an absolute blast lived in los angeles i'd lived in la recording my first album mm-hmm. where i had been like literally friends of mine would go to a nightclub they'd open a fire exit and i'd climb in through the fire exit to get in second uh, you know first sorry by the second time i was living there when my first album was out, suddenly, as I say, you're being swept in Do and you're being given door. a table. You know, in one club, I had a, a table where it was my table permanently. I had a plaque on it saying, Ooh. Table oh, 105, wow. James Blunt. I've still got the plaque. The club has closed down. It's the only <laughs> thing remaining at the club. Um, and, you know, me and my band and my friend, we we had an amazing time. And for all the shallowness of fame and the shallowness of Los Angeles and Hollywood and the music business, um, I'm a shallow person too, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> Are you still a shallow person? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah as a puddle. Yeah. As well, a what? As a puddle. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> what makes it so shallow? Not you, but what makes that in that space, that environment so shallow? Well, the music business and fame are often about uh, perception, image, what is cool, what is hip, what is hot. You know, there's a phrase, when you're hot, you're hot. When you're not, you're not. And what makes you hot? Well, it's other people's perception around you. So some bands will be really prevalent and say, that's the thing to get. And if you and you, and if you would say, I don't like that band, that would mean effectively you have no taste in mm. some way because everyone tells you this is the most amazing band. And so there is sort of pressure for you to like certain things mm-hmm. and also pressure for you to not like certain things. Um, and where where that's kind of bizarre, isn't it? You know, the notion of a guilty pleasure, what even what a kind of a question is that? You should be able to be like really open, like I listen to whatever I listen to and it's my choice. Um, I would so agree with that. Yeah. So in so the music business is based around image. Um yeah. Weirdly, in fact, I was at university in Bristol in, in the UK and I studied sociology. Um, and uh, after I'd flunked at aerospace manufacturing engineering, which I couldn't spell. Uh, <laughs> uh, and in sociology, my, my dissertation was in commodification of image, production of a pop idol. And it was just really the study of how we create pop idols, um, mm-hmm. you know, and and I'm sure there's there's talent and there's skill needed, but but record labels can bypass that if they need. <laughs> yeah, they could. I mean, it, I get the sense sometimes that they could almost manufacture the next pop star well, yeah. by pushing a certain music, a certain yeah, artist. Yeah, I mean, that's why they created X Factor. Yeah. yeah. You okay. know, because because I think the people who formed that realized that's what they've been doing for years in many, many ways. Yeah. So when you, when you became the sensation, you also have commented in the past about how you also received a lot of criticism, a lot of negative feedback from your peers in the industry. Can you talk about that a little bit? What the, what was that like? Well, I obviously had this song which was um, played to death on radio. Mm. And with that ubiquity and that incredible visibility, uh, you're going to get some blowback, I think. And um, I think also... Yeah, well, you know, in, in particularly my kind of music, you know, it's it's uh, I'm not talking about my fast car. I'm not showing off about my my expensive watch. I'm not strutting around saying how great and attractive I am and why you should be with me if you're a, a, a hot chick. I am singing about something 
which is which is trickier to absorb in many ways for you know for men i'm i'm revealing my weaknesses my frailties my fears my failings um from my perspective it takes a certain courage to stand up in front of thousands of people and actually Absolutely. reveal your inner fears your inner weaknesses 100%. that yeah. probably takes more courage uh than singing about what car you have outside which I don't, i'm not I don't really think that's very inspiring anyway no. um no. but it also is a, it's an easy target for criticism and you know in a way you and away you go so uh, so i i got a bit of blowback on that for this this you know song which is me going oh poor old me i'm never going to see you again about the girl yeah, yeah. i saw on the subway and and, and it became a, a target for some some people it's not cool it's not there's nothing cool about me and nothing cool about the music and so if it's not cool it's something that we can then point out and say hey guys that's not cool and so it became cool to have a go at it from a couple of musicians I mean, you know, I had others who said it was really good. I mean, Paul McCartney, he'll do. Yeah. He kind of liked it. <laughs> if there uh, was ever anyone, uh, it's all right. You yeah. know, Elton John, he took me out on tour. That was, you know, oh, that, that will awesome. do. But um, but Damon Albarn or or, or uh, uh, from Blur or or uh, um, one of the good, some of the Gallagher brothers, you know, they didn't like it. I thought um, Mick Jagger was another one. Um, no, no, there was a moment where he just wouldn't shake my hand, but maybe maybe he'd just gone to the loo and washed his hands. <laughs> that like could that. be something Who else. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Did that ever shape or change how you created music afterwards when you saw the blowback? Did it make you go, maybe I am showing too much of myself? Because I commend you for doing that. And I think that's the idea of, of why a, a, an artist could use their platform in such a positive, reinforcing way. Yeah. I have tried in the past to do different types of music. You know, I do. My, actually, if you listen to, you know, all, all my work, I, I've, you know, I've got dance music out there, mm -hmm. um, and, and I've got, I've got rock music out there, and uh, and all different styles of music. Whether I pull it off, especially well, is is a is a more relevant question. And what I do nail is music that conveys emotion which is kind of what music should be in the first place in some way you know it all music conveys and the one i do with most integrity is is you know the kind of songs you know me for whether it be goodbye my lover where i'm conveying mm -hmm. you know a, a, a grief over an ex who's you know she's out there somewhere um <laughs> would be easy if she weren't um <laughs> um uh, but i know where she lives uh, and you know and, and so i you know more recently i've had a song called monsters uh, which mm -hmm. has been out and sung on you know american idol and uh and you know it's done its thing it's, it's, it's and what am i talking about it's number one in the itunes charts in canada yes. as we speak yeah. uh you know that that's that's my kind of go-to is misery and, and emotion and and things that i i can can capture how i feel and i guess what it comes down to is i'm an english man who went to a boarding school and sent to boarding school when i was seven you know that's when i said goodbye to my parents never saw them again until i got famous uh and almost and uh I joined the army you know none of these things are emotional base you know none of that yeah. prescribes it's to having great opposite. emotion and if you and i are in a pub or having a chat now i'm not going to talk about how i'm feeling because i feel nothing i'm emotionally stunted yeah. apart from when you know it's in there somewhere apart from when i'm trying to convey it through music and that's when i capture it and perhaps that's why i capture it with great intensity because that's my only real outlet for it incredible that you say emotionally stunted i don't know if that's sarcasm or legitimate the way you're saying that but i'm wondering going from being seven years old a young boy to going into boarding school where from my understanding generally speaking it's kind of like pure discipline this isn't gonna this isn't about discovering yourself or anything like that it's just you're gonna follow the rules and then migrating into the army can you talk to us a little bit about that emotional stunt that yeah seems to have resonated with you yeah absolutely my um parents when i was seven years old uh told me they were taking me off to school they gave me a nintendo game and watch one of those little you know game and watches that you play yeah. i knew something was up because it wasn't my birthday and it wasn't christmas <laughs> and so you know i don't normally get presents like this or <laughs> for any other reason i got in the car and i played this game and we arrived at a a building um uh, we were taken down a corridor above a kind of what looked like a stable block into where there's a television and a, and a sitting room with some other children around about the same the same age and i played uh on this game watch for a couple more minutes and then my parents put their head around the corner and said bye and i just said bye and off they went three days later i asked a matron excuse me you know, this is in September, uh, the 1st of September, around about then. Excuse me, I said to the matron, when are my parents coming back? And she said, oh. Christmas. Um, and that's when it kind of dawned on me that, okay, here we go. 
it's a, an, a strange environment, definitely. It's all boys, no girls there. Um, the headmaster becomes your father figure. The assistant headmaster became like a mother figure um, in many ways. There are amazing opportunities, you know, masters of sport. It's a really good education. Um, but you learn a kind of independence from the need of pa of parents. I didn't need my parents so much at that stage. You've, you've got, you're in this other world. Until I got big in the music business. And when everyone else changed in the music in the world, you know, for me, when everyone suddenly saw uh, a pop star rather than this, you know, small human being in front of you, uh, that's when I kind of called my parents up and said, "Hey, I, I could do with a bit of grounding and a bit of, you know, a bit of normality." And my parents are very, very close with me and looked after me incredibly well. And even now, my father's my bookkeeper. You know, he really, you know, looks when my when I go on tour and my band invoice me, my dad pays in three hours. You know, he's the guy. He's the guy um, who, who 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 makes sure the sister the whole system works well and and they look after me. And I'm very, you know, I'm an adult, but still, you know, looked after by my parents in that way. Mm. Do you regret? Maybe regret's not the right word. Do you look back fondly on the time that you were in boarding school? Would you ever recommend it to someone else? The first five years when I was very young, that was kind of that was kind of okay. You know, as you say, you've got you know football pitches and uh, tennis courts and uh, and and other children, so that's not too bad. I think from fourteen onwards, where suddenly you're still with only boys, and I at that stage could kind of want to meet some girls along the way. Mm. I think then I stopped having fun. Um, and so the, the, of the 10 years of boarding school, the last five were pretty miserable. But I have, uh, <clears throat> but I've signed my children up so they can know my pain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have. Okay, that was my yeah. next question. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Exactly. <laughs> you want them to feel the same thing you went through. <laughs> you know, it's a thing. Um, as you say, I think it's, uh, you know, they talk about the old boys network in different ways. You know, the ties that you have. Uh, that, of course, that is, uh, it's a benefit in many ways. It's a, It helps. It's a the thing. networking. The networking. But there's another thing it gives you, which is that you are told you can be anyone and you can be anything. And that sense that open your eyes to say, you know, whatever your ambition, you can do it. And so from my school, we'd had seven prime ministers come from that school. So it means if some people here from this school have been prime ministers, then we can do it too. It just right. opens your your belief in yourself. And that's almost the greatest thing you can teach a child yes. is that whatever you want to be in life, you can be. And there are like there are local state school, which is not a private school. They do these kind of tests and they were told you could be, you know, at this. Whereas we were simply told we could be that a higher level instead. And, and, and you know, that's you're either hobbling people or opening up their ambition to anything. Empowering them. Yeah. And so even when I said I was going to be a musician, well, of course I could. I didn't know anyone in the music business. Um, no one could help me get into the music business, but I had this blind naivety that I, it was going to be okay. I was going to get myself there. You know, th it takes really hard graft, but uh, and real ambition and drive and, and work. But with but the naivety to think it's going to be okay is a thing. You know, and I, I know the likes of Ed Sheeran, and he has that complete conviction and belief in himself too. Um, and 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 that thing is your greatest weapon. And you need something like that to, to succeed in this kind of an industry. I think also if you realize how many people are trying for the same thing, you'd, you'd think I should probably go for something different. <laughs> I got a record deal. Uh, luckily, after being turned down by every record label in the UK, I was signed in the States to a, a Custard Records. I was their first signing uh, by a woman called Linda Perry. In the, uh, she was from the band Four Non Blondes. She signed me and I flew out to Los Angeles to record and then suddenly you realize there are millions of people here and they've all got the same <laughs> dream and I might have my foot on the first step of the ladder but if I'd known how many people were following this thing I, I would have you know I would have reverted to something where fewer people were trying mm -hmm. <laughs> what is something you would would have done maybe instead yeah I don't know exactly maybe a lawyer um, no and what am I thinking a hedge funder <laughs> the guys let's be hedge funders that's yeah. where the, that's yeah that's where you make the money but you know I think in most things in life you know you don't find the pot of gold wherever if everyone's running in one direction you're not going to find the pot of gold there mm -hmm. so often it's easier to you know to find whatever you're looking for is go in the opposite direction um and that's what i was doing to begin with then you realize lots of people are here too so it took a bit of luck to, to for me to get uh, uh, you know uh, up that ladder you had a an interview and i can't remember where it was so forgive me but you said I, and I, i'm going to try to quote you here if you can talk to your younger self you would punch yourself in the face well I was joking um, <laughs> uh, I 
what I meant by that actually is it was the, it was referring to the same question that a couple of musicians had been giving me a grief at you know an award ceremony and you know what I I I watched the my acceptance speech back and you know I was just joking around and I'm just being me but I just can sense the naivety again you know uh, none of it hurtful to anyone I'm just it's just uh, yeah I can just sense the naivety. Mm. Is there advice you would give your younger self if you could? Like if you can go back and be like, all right, James, I'm going to give you one piece of advice for the rest of your career. What would that be? Don't take the blue pill. <laughs> yeah, that's Trump. about it. <laughs> I think, um, I, think I, I would have advice, which is that, um, first of all, not to take any of it seriously. Uh, because you know when you're when you're exposed in the music business, you can take some stuff seriously. You know you the good stuff that's you know the accolades, even let's say an award or two, all the people telling you how great you are. You seem to forget. You focus on the negatives always very quickly. And I think you know in a negative press, which just comes, and I think to to have a thick skin and not take any of it seriously is the greatest education I could have given myself from the get go. Because mm -hmm. it was a surprise when the, when some negatives arrive. And the other one I would say is that with success comes pressure to to achieve the same level of uh, and then of success again. And to do that, you start wondering how you did it, and that 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 starts to breed insecurity. You start yeah. thinking, okay, what do I need to do? What do people want? What is it the radio station wants to hear? What is it that my record label wants? What is it that my audience want? Whereas I never thought that when I was writing songs to begin with, mm. just writing songs f about my own experience for me, for me to look in the mirror and go, this is how you, who you are and this is how you feel um, with total honesty, total integrity. When you start won wondering what other people want, then your judgment is clouded and you d aren't mm. as honest. You can't be. And so some of it will, some people want it to be a shade of black and some people in your audience will want it to be a shade of white and you've just mixed the two and just found grey. Um, so I think, yeah, it's just a, to not yeah be so concerned what others want and and follow your gut instead right from the heart um not from the head okay and what was your relationship with substances like because you've talked about that openly as well um i uh i drink after the show uh and we always have an after party i'm with you know my audience have turned up and paid good money so i'm always i i, would, I don't i'm not a guy who drinks on stage mm. um uh because I just know that they get a better performance <laughs> from someone who's sober, um, and yeah, it's just a truer thing. You know, I'm trying to I'm trying to connect with an audience, and I think you don't connect with people if you're unless you're clear, clear-headed, clear, yeah. clear-minded. Uh, as to what's more than substances, you mean, you know, rather than alcohol, if that's the question, well, I, I really try and stick to suppositories. Mm. Okay, and um, I, I'm going to ask you a question, and feel free if you're not comfortable having this conversation, but. Um, in our sort of research into this conversation, we came across a story about your relationship with Carrie Fisher. Yeah. And that she was a good friend of yours. And what was that like? What was that moment for you like when, when she passed? And how do you sort of look back on it now? I met Carrie just when I got a record deal. It was the most amazing introduction. We met in a restaurant. She was sitting beside me and she asked me what I did. I said I'd left the army. I got a record deal and I was going to record an album, my first album in Los Angeles. Her next question was, so where are you going to live? And I said, I haven't organized anywhere yet. And so she said, you're going to live with me. So just I moved like him that. just like that. Wow. So I moved in with Carrie Fisher of Princess Leia from Star Wars in her ma madhouse, chandeliers in the trees, a Christmas tree, 365 days a year, trinkets and trophies and stuff of everything that you can't imagine, you know, little dolls and posters and um, just a madness of her mind spilt out around her house. Her mother, Debbie Reynolds, living on the property too. Her mother was, for, you know, an actress from Singing in the Rain. These mm -hmm. are proper Hollywood royalty. Her mum, Debbie Reynolds, would shout at me every morning. I was in a cabin, in cabin one and cabin two, and I'd live in cabin two. She'd shout at me, hey, Charlie, you want a drink? And I'd go, hey, morning, Debbie, how you doing? I'm James. <laughs> <laughs> you sure you're not Charlie? I'm sure I'm not Charlie. I've been here for months now. You want a drink anyway? <laughs> and, uh, and that was the kind of morning ritual. Uh, and... You know, it was just a, a fantastic and amazing place to live with really creative character that was Carrie. Um, she's bipolar, uh, a, a woman who'd had problems with addiction and s spoken openly about them, um, an amazing talent and probably thinking faster than others on this planet, skipping between subjects too fast so that others think she's mad. But in fact, 
she's just moving faster than everyone yeah. and if you're just going down the alphabet why would you go through a b c and d if you know that the end is z you know so mm. she would just jump from a to z uh and yeah and so i was very lucky to live with her i recorded goodbye my lover in her bathroom where she had a piano as as you would if you live in hollywood in her bathroom um, in her bathroom how um, big was this bathroom <laughs> you know it's not, not that big not much bigger than this room really but you know you could squeeze a bath in there and a, and a piano yeah, in this I corner and, uh, <laughs> uh and yeah and so it's an incredible place to be she uh died in 2016 mm. and uh, i was with her the day before she'd come and said you know hi and goodbye to us and got on a plane and died and you know, of course, it was an absolute tragedy. Her mother died the day after as well. They buried her ashes in a Prozac pill, a giant Prozac pill. Um, and I have the only other copy in the world, um, uh, which she gave me. And and it became just, it, you know, obviously at that moment, I wanted to write a song for my friend. You know, you kind of, that's how I deal with the trauma of it. Uh, 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 and you know you go through different things of grief and anger and guilt as well uh as to whether you should have been there and done something and, and could have had a hand in it in any way um anyway so it's just taking me a long time i have now written that song it's on the new album it's called dark thought and mm -hmm. it's about a moment of madness where i was back in la obviously not living in our house anymore living in a hotel down the road and and i wanted to see if i could feel any of her, her spirit so I had, you know, I was on the way to the studio and I thought, stuff it, I'm going to drive to the house. I drove up the hill just to say goodbye. And all I found was a for sale sign and put my hand on the gate and there are tears in my eyes. These are the lyrics to the song. I was just telling the story and all that's been left since the minute you died are the chandeliers in the trees, ceramic bees, and now they're just covered in leaves. Um, and so, yeah, it was just suddenly I realized this is what the song is. It's just the journey back. I put my hand on the gate and, and I said, God, I miss you, Carrie, so much. Shared a tear. And as I did, a star map minibus full of tourists that showed the tourists where celebrities' houses are around Hollywood pulled up um, and uh, and the tour guide said over the tannoy. And as on your left, you'll see the late, great Carrie Fisher's house. And as you can see, some fans are still deeply moved by her <laughs> passing. And I was thinking, <laughs> not now. <laughs> mm. Wow. Um, uh, so, yeah, it was, it was a moment. Mm -hmm. Do you still think back on it like have you reconciled it today i mean i i think no uh with any you know great friendship and loss for the, of, of someone who's too young she was 62 i think when she died um yeah it was uh, no i think the hole is always there the the chair will always be empty um and you know at the time she's godmother to my child i asked her of my eldest i asked her to be godmother saying you know, I'd, I'm asking you to be godchild, uh, her godmother, so that he might know you one day. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you to look after yourself so that he might know you one day. Um, and, you know, and that didn't work out. Outside of writing music, how do you deal with your trauma? That's it, really. That's, That's all it. I need. Yeah. You know, if I ever I need therapy, I do interviews. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, I, I, you know, and... And if anything, you know, it's the same, it goes back to the same point and the same question, really. You know, how do you get through life in the music industry? Uh, and it's how you get through any kind of trauma is, you know, if you have a close family and you have mm -hmm. friends, then then you're in pretty good stead. If you could say something to her today, what would you say? Uh, I, I don't know. I hadn't thought about it. Um, you know, yeah, it goes back to don't play, take the blue pill, doesn't mm -hmm. it, really? Mm -hmm. uh, she got on a plane. She took, yeah, it's a thing. If you could say something to people who are working through their addiction today yeah it's just a very tricky thing to get involved in with people um i've also written a song on this album called saving a life you know you can set out to, as a friend to try and guide someone to redemption to happiness and it will be a frustration because they won't come they won't be dragged out of their their journey by you you know some people have to do what they're doing even it even it ends in their in their demise. Some people yeah. don't want to be guided out, um, and and yeah, it's a frustration. And as a friend, yeah, it's painful to watch sometimes. How do you deal with being that friend and wanting to still support them and not, I guess, shun them out like everybody else has, and not chastise them for their addiction, but still be there and still want them to know that you want them to stop. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm the, the, the right one to yeah. ask, ask the question to. You know, I, I wouldn't, I'm not someone who lectures someone on their, mm. on their lifestyle. 
um and so you know i think you you can only be there for a person i don't think you can lecture a person yeah. people are, we're like children you know if we're told not to do something we'll do it <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, really. so, so you know so i think all you can do is be there so after 21 years 21 that's the, the like, in the business, in the business i've yeah. been in for, yeah since 2002 does it ever do you ever wake up and go i don't want to be here anymore I no i love my this. job they still let me in for, to nightclubs for free, guys. That's, that's it. I can, I, I'm sure you can get in anyway, but if not, yeah. we're gonna. We're the three of us. We're in. We're going. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm. I'm so lucky. It's a job. I. Uh, I've. You know. I talked about some cons, but the pros outweigh the cons by a, a, a league. Um, I do this insanely fun job of I write songs I record them in a studio that's like a child in a toy shop really um, my, you know this uh, I have a band they're like my friends although I have to pay them to be my friends uh, <laughs> we tour the world we play concerts thousands tens of thousands uh, of people turn up um, and you know we live on a tour bus uh, 16 men on each bus uh, the bus never runs out of beer uh, <laughs> uh, it's uh, and, and we travel to really amazing fantastic places and and you know have an incredible time it's really it's it's everything you could imagine it to be um you know we started out as single men three of my bandmates have married people from the audience nice. um and uh and yeah they weren't the first people who met necessarily but uh <laughs> but it's a story of true romance and love on the road yeah. um but that's who that's who we'd meet anyway because our lives are just as touring Constantly full-time touring people, yeah. musicians um and and we've and what i mean by that is you know we've shared We've shared life with people, shared life with the audience, and uh, and and had an amazing time. And I'm very lucky to still be doing it. How do you balance being a musician of this caliber and being a husband and a father? Like, how do you balance the family component? Yeah, I mean, I uh, I'm married to a really strong character um, who uh, who who can handle that. Uh, um, we have spare bunks on the tour bus. Friends and family can come and join in. Uh, when I'm not on tour, we live in amazing places. I live in Ibiza, um, uh, in, in the Mediterranean. So basically when I get a bit of holiday, my home is in a holiday resort, yeah. uh, which kind of makes sense. But it's also a place that's, um, yeah, it's an amazing way of life there. It's the kind of dance music club capital of the world. So we, we you know, we have a, we, li we live in a really fun place. As to parenting, I'm hands on when I'm there. Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself wanting more time as a parent or is like the balance that you've struck between career and family working for you right now it depends how annoying they are at home <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess <laughs> yeah um no i mean it's, it's definitely harder uh, uh, as as he says as a single man traveling the world i could do it forever right. um when my when the people who are important to me aren't there it's much much harder definitely um, and a Zoom call is, or a, you know a FaceTime call yeah. is only, only it's not the same. It's not not the same. No. Um, but it's my job, and I and I'm as I say, it's the way you know, it's the way I make a living, and it's uh, and I'm lucky to do it. And friends and family come and join in where they can. Hmm. Would I want to go back in time for a moment here? Would younger James look at the current version sitting in front of us today and say, "I'm proud of that version"? I uh, you know I don't know. You're asking me to say my. It's a tricky one, you know. I ha I have my feet on the ground, um, and uh, the music business is full of people who have been swallowed up and spat out by the music business, and they've been damaged by it. Um, and, and I know some of those people. It's a tough place. So I think to go through it, um, and still have a smile on your face, um, but not be deeply scarred by it, is is an achievement in itself. Um, and so, yeah, I think so. You know, have I made mistakes along the way? Definitely. Do I have ambitions to, you know, to uh, still, yeah. You know, I'm playing arenas around the world. Mm -hmm. There are stadiums out there and I'd be nice to play in those too. <laughs> so that, you know, so there's there's always a goal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, could it be worse? Could it just be, you know, could it be theaters and clubs? It could be that. And could I be out of the business? So, yeah, um, I'm, a, I'm a lucky human being. Um, have I got through without being scarred? Yeah, just about. How did you how did you keep yourself out of distance from that? Like, how did you protect yourself? Because, you know, a few years is one thing. Two decades is another. So that's a lot of different opportunities for the music industry to, as you said, chew you up and spit you back out and damage you and all those things. So how did you protect yourself from that throughout well, your career? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, firstly, perspective. 
um, you know, I, I get asked in interviews, hey, does it, you know, are you affected by these negative things that we've read online about you? Mm-hmm. And I'll say, let's show me. And there'll be five negative things that someone's found on Twitter that day. And we'll be, as we're speaking about the five nasty tweets, uh, there'll be a queue outside of thousands of people coming into the venue. And so, you know, you look in the journalist in the eye and you can either be affected by those four negatives or you <laughs> go, is this is this out of proportion? Are you, right, the, yeah. the people who are tweeting, they're, you know, they're probably, in a, you know, men in their middle ages still living with their parents, probably at home with their trousers around their ankles, <laughs> sending you a negative, <laughs> nasty tweet. And, and they haven't bothered even to come to you to say it to your face. They haven't turned up to the venue. They haven't spent any money investing in their hate towards you. Right. They just did it from home. Yeah. Um, whereas these other people outside in their hundreds and thousands have, you know, they, they've spent their hard earned money to come and see you. They're queuing out in England in the rain uh, and they're here maybe in Toronto in the snow. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, and, they, and they've, you know, booked hotels and and as I say, flights, trains, and, and taxis—they've um, invested in you, and their and their and their appreciation of of what I might be putting out. I think I should be th- thanking them and putting it in perspective of the negatives instead. Um, and so, yeah, once you realise that, hang on, people are buying this stuff, and people are turning up, and people are cheering you on. I should be really grateful for that and respect them enough to say the negatives they out, they outweigh those negatives. Um, you know, hundredfold, thousandfold, maybe more. Yeah. It's just human nature to always be uh, drawn towards our negatives, be affected by the negatives. Even on Twitter, you know, I can read it. I see our hundred positives and I just glance over them. They're almost like boring. Yeah. <laughs> but the negatives, that's the, where you go. That's, 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 the, that's yeah. all you see. But then, you know, and, I, and I, you, if you've seen it, I use social media in a particular way. I'm on Twitter, I don't really use it on the whole. I try not to, to advertise my music too much. I just use it to abuse mainly myself uh, and and laugh at the whole notion of being of the negatives. To laugh at myself, laugh for reading it and being affected by it, and laugh, laughing at the people for at posting it. But hopefully, in a in a in a in a in a kind, humorous way. Mm. That seems to be the little trick that I'm gathering is the ability to not take yourself too seriously because then you don't take those types of comments too seriously. Definitely. There's a real moment I know I've had when you read something negative and if it does sting, then you must never reply at that moment. You need to just step away, think about it. Mm. And that if you come in, because if you come in, you know, five minutes later, the emotion will have gone and the bite will have gone. And instead of uh, replying, you know, like someone who's been hurt, then you'd come in with the answer you wanted to come in as if you were jostling with someone, as if you and I and, and you and I were just taking the, the mickey out of each other when we're having a drink and you say that about me and I'll say something back to you and it's with love. Yes. And then when you're back saying it with love, back to the person who's, you know, as if as if they were your friend, mm-hmm. then it's all then it's all good. You know, then then you then you start winning mm-hmm. um, and in, and you start enjoying it. Do you still use Twitter now that it's X? Because a lot of people stopped as don't use it as much well you know I, I think it's a terrible platform really um, X or Twitter because you were both I think okay. you know I think it's got worse absolutely it's okay. more extremist now uh, it was we had a phrase didn't we that our parents taught us uh, if you you know keep your opinion to yourself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that was a really good sound bit of advice our mothers gave us <laughs> um, and the other one she gave us was um, if you don't have anything nice to say okay. don't say anything at all, at all. absolutely yeah. yeah they invented Twitter and we forgot that <sighs> And we just started thinking our opinions mattered. Um, and we thought our opinions were fact. That's in fact, they were validated by uh, the amount of... Exactly. Yeah. And and off we went, just starting to really then just be, you know, yeah, vocalize how we were and how, what we thought about the world without the balance, the civility of a conversation, um, without the compassion of a, uh, a conversation, without the humanity again of human to human, eye to eye, just, the, you know, seeing each other. Um, and so, and it's bec- and it's got far, far worse along the way. But I think Elon Musk is a genius. I think he's realised how poisonous uh, Twitter is, and his genius is he's killing the bird from within. Slowly, he realises yeah. it's bringing bringing our society down, which it probably is. And I, I think he's killing it from within, and it's going to just pull the plug, um, and we'll all be released, and we'll drop our phones, and we'll just start talking to each other like normal humans again, and <laughs> yeah. the world will be good. <sighs> That'd yeah, nice. I think I think we could use a little more detachment from from our phones and from social media. Yeah, I mean, like, so I, I guess that leads me to another question here: is as an artist, a lot of your a lot of things are coming at you constantly, day and night, and you know we get notifications on our phones. You're gonna get 
hundreds of notifications, thousands of notifications on your phone, whether it's from your Twitter account, whether from your Instagram account, et cetera, et cetera. How do you balance constantly having your phone on you and sort of putting it away and being like, I'm going to I'm going to detach from this? Um, I don't think I necessarily am good at detaching myself from it. I turn off my notifications there off because okay. uh, otherwise it would be buzzing all the time. Um but no, I mean, I think it's uh, I think it's an issue for all of us, really. You know, the, the having the phone a- around sure, is yeah. is a problem. Um, uh, I know I struggle with it. Yeah, tremendous. definitely. Yeah, terrible with it. Yeah, it's like constantly like just con- looking at it, and then if you, my worst is sometimes I'll open up my phone to do something, and I get distracted by three notifications, and now I'm down a completely different rabbit hole, and I forgot why I looked yeah, it in the first place. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a thing, isn't it? Um, and I think I've you know. You can tell a child off for watching too many, much, you know, screen time, and that that child would be within their rights probably to turn around to any of us and say, "Hold on, <laughs> you do the same you're the thing. guy yeah, on the yeah. screen." <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're the guy on the screen. Um, so, talk to us about. We've talked about your album a bit, but talk to us about what's coming up for you. Are you going on tour? Well, I've just uh, I've just written a book. Just uh, a memoir. Uh, yeah, it's. Yeah, I uh, wanted to ask you about that too. Exactly, it's called loosely based on a made-up story. Uh, it's all true, but I've called it that just so I have a legal get-out clause. <laughs> uh, and uh, if they're stories that again I would be telling you uh, over a drink in a pub, and I should not probably publish them, write them down, or publish mm. them. And uh, but you just decided, screw it, I'm going to do it. Well, you know, I think I need to write them down now, or else in any any later, and I'd have forgotten them in my life. The 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 memory would have been too muddied. Um, and uh, and so I think I can probably get away with telling some of them now too. Uh, I lived a roller coaster ride, you know, in in Los Angeles, mm. at an amazing time really when when the paparazzi were kind of going mental, chasing around a few people around that time of the the Parises, the Lindsays, the Britneys, um, and uh, and I was you know in, in that world, and it was uh, an amazing time to be there really, and a and a high life and a low life too. And so, so I've written all of that, mm. but I've written about the context of what happened in the army before and and school, and it's it, it's a very different story from what you hear in my music. It's a you know it's it's a, a madness, um, a roller coaster, where rather than the earnest side of the music. And so, yeah, you know, beyond that, we we did a documentary as well, which is a kind of same thing. I put a doc, um, these guys came and filmed me. I really wanted them to film and me to look back and kind of say yeah I'm kind of like the English musical equivalent of Tom Cruise didn't really pan out that way <laughs> kind of like a you know deeply uncool human being um, with a kind of you know weird weird touring family who who, are, who can't get rid of me and I can't get rid of them um, but it's a very funny funny viewing and uh, but that's the family I, 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 I live with on the road we're going out on the road again from February kicking off in Europe and we'll move around the world hopefully getting to Canada at some stage yeah yeah, yeah no that'd be great do you have a Canada date ready yet or we don't we're just uh, talking about it and, and seeing where out you know you, you feel out uh, an album it's just come out yes. you feel out an album and see what kind of reception and then we'll book venues from there so yeah. um, and I've always had an amazing time here you know Toronto I filmed my favourite uh, video called Same Mistake um, in the city um, I know some some naughty people in your city who take me out and we have great great fun and uh, so it's always a blast to be here you know same over in places like Montreal I've been looked after Vancouver it's always a really fun place yeah mm. Montreal's a good time definitely well. yeah Amazing. James, thank you so much for coming through. Thanks so much for having me. This was incredible. It was nice to, to sort of pull that curtain back and, and talk to the man behind the persona. I feel yeah. like and we read your memoir, except we just talked through your memoir. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's nice because actually so many people come with questions in a way that, you mm. know, prep questions which don't lead to a conversation. Yeah. Um, whereas it's nice to just chat, thing, you know, talk it through. Yeah. yeah. No, that's great. And best of luck with the tour. Best of luck with the the, the memoir, the documentary, so the much. album. We're yeah. rooting for you. And if you're ever coming to Toronto, please Definitely. let us know. We'd yeah, I will do that. You should. Yeah, show, you show me a nicer side of Toronto yeah. than, I'll show, than the dark I'll show, I'll side. Show you a good time. I'll show yeah. you a good time. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. I'm in. Amazing. James, thank you so much. Appreciate, Thanks, appreciate guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.